911 your emergency? I got a, I'm my wife's sick. I'm blood everywhere. You need an ambulance? Yes, okay, I hold on a second. Everything. Hang on, let me get to a medical dispatcher. Hold on, sir. What's the address you need an ambulance at? Well, I need uh, uh, 20481 Robinson Glen Drive, uh, Cottonwood, California. What's the nearest cop street there? Um, it's Londa Road. Londa? Okay. Then what's the phone number you're calling from? Tell me exactly what happened. She's, I just came in the room. I heard her. She's got blood everywhere. Everywhere. I don't know. I, can't have, I have no idea. You have no idea what happened? Uh. In the town of Cottonwood, located in California, happily lived a Mormon family of seven. This family was relatively well known in the area and was comprised of five sons by the name of Jason, Jacob, Tyler, Troy, and Casey, as well as their mother and father, who will be promptly presented as the main focus of this video. Just hours after attending Casey's baseball game on May 4, 2012, a sequence of events took place that can mainly be described as brutal, tragic, and perplexing. While on the way out from the ball game, Casey gratefully accepted a $20 bill from his mother and headed towards a cinema across town to see a 9.15 p.m. showing of the 2012 hit Marvel Comics movie, The Avengers. Casey's mother and father headed to watch a movie as well, rather in the comfort of their own home. Then, at precisely 12.56 a.m. on the morning of May 5, 2012, the Shasta County Police Dispatch received an emergency call from an emotionally distraught man. This is 51-year-old Mark Duenas. As we have already observed at the beginning of this video, Mark Duenas has just placed a call to 911 claiming to have heard a loud noise and then sequentially stumbled upon the bloodied body of his then-wife, Karen Duenas. Though Mark appears completely aware of the gravity of the situation that he has found himself in, he has yet to locate the source of the bleeding or even determine if his wife is still breathing. He seems to lack the ability to ascertain whether or not Karen is even awake and has already made several questionable statements throughout the phone call. Let's now play the remainder of this call before doing a more analytical replay. Is she awake? She's awake, but she's still. I need somebody here right now. Please. Okay. You don't know where she's bleeding from? No, I know. I just blood everywhere. Okay. I don't know where it's coming from. Are you with her now? Yes. Oh, it's in her chest. How old is she? She's 40. I I understand. Is she awake? I, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know? She's got, I, I, is she, 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 no, she's not. She's awake. I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Oh, please, please. Is she breathing? I need to give you instructions, so I need to know this. Is she I, breathing? I can call next door. My son works for the fire department. I want to go over here to help her. Can I, can I, I try to call next door, okay? Okay. emergency? I got a, I'm stuck my wife's sick. I'm blood everywhere. I got a, I'm stuck my wife's sick. I'm blood everywhere. What you have just heard could be interpreted as a moment that a panicked Mark Duenas immediately confessed to the murder of his wife via a potential Freudian slip. Unfortunately, the poor audio quality of this phone call make it quite difficult to determine whether or not Mark said this. I'm stuck my wife's sick. I'm blood everywhere. Or this. I'm stuck my wife's sick. Regardless of the poor audio quality, this moment and several others will have significant importance later on in this video. Shortly after this call is placed, Mark's son Casey ran over to Jason's house who lived directly next door and worked as a volunteer firefighter. Casey entered the home yelling, Jason, come quick, there is something wrong with mom. Casey and Jason then quickly returned to Mark and Karen's home and fell upon a bloody crime scene. Jason then realized that the amount of blood was significant and that he likely has now missed the opportunity to revive his mother in any way. In his own words, Jason stated, I likely missed her last breaths by a few minutes. Jason then immediately makes another phone call to 911. 911, your emergency? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the second call for the same medical. Um, yeah. Are you talking, was this about your wife that was bleeding, sir? It's my, it's my mother. Oh, your mother. Yeah. I'm actually a, a firefighter for Cottonwood. Uh, they don't need to stage. Okay. Are you on Robinson Glen? Yes, Gina Secure. Okay. Um, and what's your name? My name is Jason. Jason? Okay. And this is your mom? This okay. is my mom. All right. 
Can you tell me if she's stable? Uh, Tina's secure. Uh, possible 1144. Okay. I'll let him know, all right? Thank you. All right, Jason. Relatively quickly after this call, first responders arrive on the scene and attempt to revive Karen with no success, and Karen Duenas is pronounced dead on the scene. Karen is then transported from the home, while Mark is taken to the police station for questioning. I'm in my room asleep. Yeah. I hear crazy noise. And you, you know, you hear a cat sound like it wasn't cats, it was a weird scream. Talking or? No, I just heard some weird screaming type stuff. And what did you do from there? I ran, I got up, and I, because I, I didn't want those, whatever was going on to wake up my wife, because I, you know, I'm sensitive like that. And I went to the, the door by the kitchen, opened it up, and looked out there. I didn't see any cats. Shut it, walked down the hallway, looked under, the lights were on. So I figured she's up. Opened the door, and that's when I found her. Due to a few critical observations made by the officers, Mark was immediately under suspicion. However, he was not immediately arrested for the murder as a full investigation has yet to take place. Regardless, the next day, the Shasta County Police publicly make a statement to not worry about any potential murderers or burglars wandering the streets of Cottonwood, and that the murder is likely a contained incident. Some of the initial observations made by the investigators were as follows. Upon arrival, some of the officers found that the way the blood appeared at the crime scene reflected that of a crime scene that had likely happened many hours earlier. Mark and Karen slept in separate rooms, and they found that Karen's bedroom window, which faced the backyard, had been tampered with at some point, as it appeared the window screen had been completely sliced open diagonally. They also found a trail of fresh footprints leading from Karen's bedroom window out through the backyard, through a gate in the fence, and then down towards a canal. After speaking with some nearby neighbors, the officers also gathered information regarding a car that was heard racing down the street and away from the Duena's residence earlier that night, as well as a witness that spotted a small group of people that did not look as if they belonged in the area, walking around the Duena's residence earlier that day. Due to a lack of confirmation on witness statements regarding the car and the group of people, investigators began to focus in on Mark. Investigators noted that despite Karen's window screen being cut open and tampered with, it appeared as though the shutters had not been moved or damaged in any way, leading them to believe that nobody had made an entrance directly through Karen's window. They also went on to believe that Mark likely murdered his wife and then cleaned up the scene hoping for his son Casey to return home from the movies and discover Karen's body. Unfortunately for Mark, Casey stated that when he arrived home from the movies, he went directly to bed, and then moments later was woken up by Mark in a panic, pleading with Casey to fetch brother Jason from next door to help mom. On top of all of this, Mark also made several statements during his initial police interviews regarding a second woman in his life, which led investigators to believe that Mark had a motive for murder. It's what was going on in our life, um, and it's, it scares me when I think about it. You know, I'm... We kind of got carried away with a little texting here and there. There's pictures of um, just maybe um, me or her, you know, just little innocent, um, you know, we're not into any of that nasty porn, none of that. Right. It was just, what do you look like now? You know, it's, she'd send a picture of her, of her and she goes, your turn. She does a quilt or she took a picture of her quilt showed it to me, right. stuff, stuff, this innocent stuff. She took, had a picture of her and her grandkid, and, she, and stuff like that. Just five months later, in October of 2012, Mark Duenas was arrested for the murder of Karen Duenas. Now moving away from the weather briefly, for the first time tonight, we are hearing from the family of the Cottonwood man accused of killing his wife last year. Mark Duenas was arrested in October for murdering his wife of 33 years, Karen. She was a Shasta College instructor and mother of five boys found stabbed to death in their home in May. Right afterward, Mark was named a person of interest, but wasn't arrested until about six months later. KRCR News Channel 7, Shay Arthur spoke with the family today. Shay. Mike, nearly 20 of Mark's supporters gathered at the Shasta County Courthouse this afternoon. They included his family, friends, and his co-workers. Mark appeared before the judge for less than two minutes. The purpose of his appearance was to make sure everything was on track for his expected trial in May. A trial his family is anxious to get underway, as both the Duenas family as well as Karen's family continue to maintain his innocence. Mark's attorney spoke on the family's behalf. Family members were aware of this relationship, including our mother. 
While she was not thrilled about it, our parents were still very much in love with one another and were in no way in a marital crisis. They also said their father has been unfairly portrayed by his infamous 911 call, where law enforcement claims he admitted to killing Karen. But they say that's not true either. Now that the 911 call has been made public, it is obvious that our father said no such thing. However, we are fearful that the damage had already been done. And finally, the Duenas family said little attention has been given to the fact that Mark passed a polygraph test administered by a former FBI polygraph expert. Dad is a caring, loving man who is deeply in love with our mother and misses her every day, just as we all do. Shortly after being arrested for the murder of Karen, Mark's direct family, as well as Karen's direct family, immediately rallied behind Mark's innocence. As the prosecution continued to build a case against Mark, claiming that a plethora of evidence, including self-incriminating statements, all pointed towards Mark's guilt, Mark and Karen's family sought out an attorney to defend Mark in his upcoming trial. The attorney that they attained goes by the name of Mr. Ron Powell. But, you know, when I saw her family saying, well, can you help us, that type of stuff, and us meant Mark. That's when I started to think, you know. The trial began just under a year after Mark's arrest in the summer of 2013. The prosecution presented a case that showcased Mark as a poor husband that was constantly sneaking around behind Karen's back. They stated that after Karen was initially made aware that Mark was texting with a secret woman, which he used to attend high school with, sending each other pictures, and even telling each other, I love you, that Karen was understandably extremely upset. Karen asked Mark to stop texting her, but instead, Mark went out and purchased a secret second cell phone to continue doing so. The text between the two continued for a number of months after the confrontation until the prosecution believes that Karen learned about the second cell phone and told Mark that she wanted a divorce. They would go on to state that Mark then murdered Karen in an act of controlling rage sometime around 10 p.m. on May 4th. He then cleaned himself up and staged the house to look like an intruder committed the crime. Mark then pretended to be asleep and waited for his son Casey to arrive home and discover his mother's body. When Casey went directly to bed, Mark then had to think fast and manufactured a story about a cat noise waking him up and causing him to discover Karen himself. The defense would reiterate Mark's initial story, where Mark states that he and Karen arrived home shortly after Casey's baseball game. They then watched a movie together, and when the movie was over, Karen went to bed before Mark, while Mark stayed up a little bit longer and watched some of a Giants game that was playing that night. He then went to bed within an hour or two after Karen and then woke up to a cat noise. He walked through his hallway to the back door in the kitchen and looked outside for a cat that possibly made the noise. When he didn't see a cat, he then went up to check on Karen. He noticed that the lights were on inside of Karen's room, and he believed that she must have been awake. He then entered the room, found her covered in blood, and immediately called 911. The defense also went on to poke holes inside of the prosecution's claims stating that witness statements prove that there is a possibility that the house had been surveilled by a strange group of people earlier that day, as well as the sound of a car racing away around the right time of that night. They would demonstrate how it is still highly possible for an intruder to have entered Karen's room through the bedroom window without extensively disturbing the shutters. The defense would also claim that the most likely sequence of events was that an intruder likely broke into Karen's room with the intent on robbing the home, but was then startled when they came upon Karen. A short fight ensued, and Karen was stabbed and slashed by the intruder, causing the intruder to panic and then abandon the crime scene without stealing any items at all. The jury took several days to bring back a decision. However, due to a reported stubbornness of one of the jurors, the decision came back as a mistrial due to a hung jury on August 6, 2013. A second trial was then rescheduled for October 1st of the same year. Immediately after the first trial, the entirety of Mark and Karen's family then made a public plea. One of the statements that we made a long time ago, and this is obviously incredibly difficult, uh, the statement is that unless, unless you've had an opportunity to experience this for yourself, there's no way you can understand. This family is close, both sides, always have been, and we're in support and we haven't seen any reason not to be. And it's not over. We're going to continue uh, to fight through this. We'll stay together um, and try to get to where this needs to be. I have nothing further. I just want to make a simple point. You see these people? This is love. This is belief in this human being. This is not question in our hearts. Please listen to us and know we love this man and he's a good man. 
That's all. Thank you. We know them very well. Um, been with them since the very beginning. You know, as a child, when they were going out as high school teenagers, uh, know them very well. And we all support Mark completely. We don't think that he was capable of this. And, uh, we're completely behind him and supporting him. During the months between the two trials, a new prosecutor was added to the case. This is Stephanie Bridget. Stephanie Bridget became dead set on having Mark Duenas convicted of the murder of Karen Duenas. She went on to build a case consisting of most of the evidence used during the previous trial, as well as a handful of new evidence that she believed would be enough to win over the jury. This time, the prosecution began their opening with the words, I gotta, I'm stuff my wife's shit and blood everywhere. Stephanie then continued to buckle down on some of the accidental slip-ups that she believed Mark had made throughout his conversations with law enforcement, like this one. Because the way he cut her, that's the only cut I saw, and there was tons of blood. Mm -hmm. But there was none there coming out when I... Whoever did it, I don't think there was tons of blood, mm -hmm. but there was none in there coming out when I, whoever did it, I don't know, up when I, up when I, up when I. Stephanie also believed that she had located the murder weapon inside the Duenas residence. She claimed that the knife used to stab and slash at Karen was actually a knife from the butcher block located in the kitchen. Her reasoning for believing this is due to the knife handle showing trace amounts of some type of chemical cleaner as well as an animal fat. Stephanie would then call Mark's secret girlfriend to the stand to testify, which she would mostly confirm that her and Mark would only exchange messages and had never actually met in person, claiming her beliefs that the communication was harmless. However, she also stated that Mark made a strange remark one day that something terrible would have to happen in order for the two of them to actually be together. Finally, Stephanie claimed that the shirt and shorts that were taken from Mark after the first police interview on the night of the murder were actually covered in blood. However, she said it appeared as though Mark attempted to clean these articles of clothing before attending the police station, as the blood was not visible to the naked eye. The defense argued that the knife could have been cleaned at any time, and that the animal fat and cleaner residue on the knife was absolutely not indicative that the knife was used in the murder, as no blood or DNA of Karen's was found on it at all. They then confirmed with Mark's secret girlfriend that the strange statement that Mark made was actually several months before the murder took place, and it was seemingly made passively and was in no way taken seriously. The defense also challenged the remarks made regarding Mark's clothing on the night of the murder. They would state that Mark would obviously have blood on him as he was attempting to determine what happened to his wife and where she was injured. They argued that Mark did not try to clean his clothing and that the only reason the blood was not immediately noticeable was due to the fact that he was wearing a red shirt and black shorts. They ended their defense by explaining the relationship between Mark and Karen and by having several character witnesses to take the stand and provide testimony about the strength of the marriage between the two. They emphasized the 33 years that the two were together, and no domestic issues or public marital complaints. They emphasized the five sons that the two had together, and the fact that the two still continued to go on regular dates with each other. They also emphasized the visible love and care between the two that many others would observe on a regular basis. The trial came to a close, and Mark's attorneys put up a viable defense. However, after only one day of deliberation, the jury came back and Mark Duenas was found guilty of the first-degree murder of Karen Duenas. He was then sentenced to 25 years to life on December 6, 2013. In a quite strange series of events, Mark's son, Jacob Duenas, who was a former highway patrol officer, was arrested a year and a half later on accusations of child rape and molestation. Jacob Duenas faced trial and was convicted in September of 2018. He was sentenced to 26 years in the same prison his father resides. Mark Duenas and Jacob Duenas are both currently serving their sentences at the Folsom State Prison near Sacramento, California. The case was investigated to the fullest and prosecuted ethically, and he is guilty of the crime and deserves the sentence that he received today. And I didn't do it. And I, I, I mean, it's crazy. Okay, it's just like OJ. We need to be out there finding the real killers, right? LAPD, they didn't have to go find the real killers. I know you're doing your job, but I would never lay a hand on my life. I did not hurt her. I did not kill her. I walked in and found her in her condition.